Our next session is entitled Managing Side Effect of Colorectal Cancer Treatment. In this session, we will learn about the side effect of chemotherapy and radiation and how to cope with treatment side effects. We have two very interesting presentations lined up. Dr. Charlene Gale, uh, a medical oncologist at the BC Cancer and Professor of Medicine at the University of British Columbia, will speak about the side effect of chemotherapy. Dr. Shiloh Lefrain, a radiation oncologist, also at BC Cancer, will follow up and talk about the side effect of radiation therapy. After their presentation, we will be joined by Rebecca Latimer, uh, an advanced nurse practitioner, and Aneta Fishman, a stage 3B colorectal cancer survivor, for a panel discussion. We will then turn to the audience for your question. Just a quick reminder, uh, Reminder, you can always use at the top right of your screen the question button to capture your question as you're listening to the presentation. Thank you, uh, Dominique, for the introduction and my thanks to the uh, organizers for the invitation to um, present today. So. Um, I'm going to be starting off talking about chemotherapy. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So I think, um, you know, in thinking about the context of how we treat cancer, I think we, in our armamentarium, we think about buckets, we think about surgery, we think about radiation, which we're going to hear about, and then we think about chemotherapy. And, uh, very generally, chemotherapy is defined as a systemic treatment, meaning that these are medicines or drugs that travel in the bloodstream and can go throughout the entire body. And these can be in an intravenous or parenteral form, or they can be as pills, as oral chemotherapy. Um, in colorectal cancer in particular, we kind of think of the classes of systemic treatments or chemotherapies, and we think about traditional chemotherapy. So for colorectal cancer, that sometimes is referred to as cytotoxic chemotherapy. So these are things like 5-fluorouracil, also known as 5-FU, uh, which is an IV form and also has an oral version, which is called capecitabine. We think about oxaliplatin, which is a class of IV chemotherapy, and we have arinotecan, which is another class of IV chemotherapy. And typically, we'll use combinations of these uh, in treatment of, of colorectal cancer. Um, we also have targeted therapies, uh, and the most commonly used are uh, bevacizumab, which is an uh, IV targeted therapy, and it targets uh, uh, an agent called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. And we have two drugs in a class of drugs called um, epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR antibodies, uh, panitumumab and cetuximab, that are also given IV in um, patients whose tumors are believed to respond to that kind of a strategy. Um, generally, when we think about cancer chemotherapy, there are discussions about uh, hormonal therapy, but because colorectal cancer is not a hormone-sensitive cancer, that's usually not a practical uh, application. Uh, and I think, you know, we hear a lot about immunotherapy, and I would say that, unfortunately, this is largely not applicable, except for a very small number of colorectal cancer um, cases, and so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. Next slide. Um, it's also kind of when we think about what is the role of chemotherapy in the management of colorectal cancer treatment, um, there's sort of two big settings. So one is where it's curative. So typically that is a situation where someone one has definitive surgery to remove their primary uh, colorectal cancer, and chemotherapy is given afterwards in an adjuvant intent to reduce the risk of recurrence. Uh, and sometimes it's neoadjuvant, meaning there is a plan for definitive surgery, but chemotherapy is given before to try to improve the outcomes uh, from surgery and beyond. Um, and then a second situation uh, is a situation where the chemotherapy is not able to achieve a cure. So it's not curative, and sometimes that's also referred to as palliative. And the goal of chemotherapy in that situation is to try to control disease, is to try to extend life living with cancer, and also try to minimize the, the symptoms uh, related to uh, colorectal cancer. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, when we think about how chemotherapy works, so traditional chemotherapy drugs typically kill cancer cells by interfering with how they divide. So that's usually through sort of damage to the DNA of that cancer cell. And so many of the side effects, which is what we're talking about today, of traditional chemotherapy can really be traced to damage to normal cells that also happen to divide rapidly and may be susceptible to, the, to that chemotherapy. Um, so, so thinking of normal systems in our body that divide rapidly and might be more sensitive to chemotherapy are things like the bone marrow. So that's when we worry about low counts. It's the digestive tract. So, and that can be anything from inflammation in the lining of the mouth or mouth sores down to sort of irritation in the gut or diarrhea. Uh, and we also think about, you know, the hair follicles, which grow rapidly, and we worry about risk of hair loss with chemotherapy. Next slide. Um, I, I'm going to talk about sort of side effects that are associated sort of more generally and with specific agents in colorectal cancer treatment. But I think it's important as a patient to remind ourselves that um, different people will experience different side effects from the same drug. And that has to do with how we as individuals um, metabolize and process those medications. Uh, and the other thing to remember is that when we talk about side effects from treatment, whatever they may be, these are possible side effects. We don't expect that every person will experience all these side effects, but it is important to be informed so that we can proactively think about how we would manage those side effects should they occur. Next slide. So um, in terms of what I would call sort of generic, more general side effects of chemotherapy, um, and again, we're thinking more about traditional chemotherapy. So nausea is a, is a common side effect. It's a moderate risk with agents like oxaliplatin and arinotecan, but typically a low risk with things like 5-FU or the targeted agents that I mentioned, like the bevacizumab or the EGFR antibodies. Um, and the good news is that these typically can be treated proactively with the use of anti-nausea medication, uh, typically prescribed before uh, the treatment is administered to try to minimize both sort of the short, short term and the delayed uh, nausea that's related to chemotherapy. Um, another general side effect is diarrhea. Again, this is most commonly with um, erinotecan and 5-fluorouracil, whether it's the IV or the oral form. Um, and uh, the strategies around managing that are really to keep ensure that we keep well hydrated and use anti-motility agents. So things like loperamide, also known as Imodium. Um, I talked about sort of the effect of chemotherapy on the bone marrow. So uh, you know, that leads to concerns about low blood count. So specifically, we talk about low white cells. Those are, that may pose a risk for infection and suppressing the immune system. Uh, low red cells are what we call anemia. Um, so that might manifest as fatigue and feeling tired or, or low platelets. And that usually uh, associates with kind of risk of bleeding. And so with low platelets, the kinds of bleeding that we might experience are things like sometimes gum bleeding when we're brushing our teeth or nose bleeds or easy bruising. That's kind of the, the, the things to watch, be watchful for with low platelets. Um, monitoring counts while we're on chemotherapy does require fairly frequent scheduled testing. Um, and for those of you who've been on treatment, at, you, know, you know that there is a fairly prescriptive schedule for blood work while on chemotherapy. And there are strategies to manage certain effects of low counts should they become a problem. So for example, there are growth factor supports to help support white cells if they are low. Um, and it's important to be watchful for a fever because we worry about infection with low counts. Next slide. Um, another general effect of chemotherapy is that it does have an impact on fertility. So for people who are of childbearing age, uh, you know, it's important to understand the potential impact on future fertility with chemotherapy and also uh, where it's relevant to avoid pregnancy while on chemotherapy and taking precautions to minimize that risk. Um, and then the other general precaution with chemotherapy is the risk of drug interactions. So ensuring that your, uh, your oncology team um, is aware of all the medications that you're on, whether they're prescription medications or supplements or over-the-counter medications, um, because th those um, interactions need to be thought about early um, before prescribing chemotherapy drugs. Next slide. Um, 
So I'm going to go just end off talking about some specific side effects that um, we see in, in the treatment of colorectal cancer uh, related chemotherapy. And so capecitabine I mentioned is the oral version of 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. Um, you know, patients will often kind of light up when I say it's oral chemotherapy. And I'm concerned that sometimes they think that means it's less side effects. And oral does not mean less side effects. It just means different. It's a different what delivery system, but it's still the same active drug in our system. And so we still have to be mindful about the concern that related to chemotherapy side effects. Um, capecitabine is usually given on a twice a day schedule. And the most common schedule in which it's used when it's on its own is kind of two weeks on, one week off. Uh, but there can be differences in schedule. Um, and the side effect, you know, aside from the things I talked about in terms of general effects, um, that's most noticeable with capecitabine is something called the hand foot syndrome. That's kind of a distinctive side effect of capecitabine. And, and typically it can be redness or swelling or pain and occasional peeling often on the palms or the soles uh, of the feet. Um, so some precautions, you know, are to try to remove calluses before starting on treatment. If there's a window where that can be done, can be helpful. Um, avoiding extreme temperatures like really hot water as that dries out the skin and may predispose it for this hand foot syndrome. Um, and avoiding rubbing and friction. So that's like things like not, we, we sort of say don't wear tight shoes, tight socks, try to let your feet breathe when possible, um, but not walking around barefoot. So there's kind of this fine line. Uh, with the hands, avoiding things like rubber gloves, they tend to cause a lot of rubbing um, and can cause blisters uh, uh, and applying cream liberally. And I've put a picture there of something called Utterly Smooth, which is a, a cream that works very well for capecitabine related hand foot syndrome. Um, capecitabine's other effect on the skin is it can make us more sensitive to sunlight. So using sunscreen and uh, protection from the sun uh, when outdoors is also important. Next slide. Um, another sort of specific distinct side effect with colorectal cancer chemotherapy is uh, the sort of the nerve side effects that may be experienced with the IV chemotherapy drug oxaliplatin. Uh, and this is a, um, you know, it's, it's a very commonly experienced side effect. Um, and initially patients aren't, aren't too concerned about it because it sounds like it's minor, but it can be, become very bothersome over time. So oxaliplatin typically in its early stages of when we first start to use it, people experience sensitivity to cold. So we talk about cold avoidance don't drink anything cold, don't touch anything cold, especially for the few days after your IV infusion. Uh, but over time, if we're using it for a longer period of time, there can be cumulative effects where people may notice um, that they have some neuropathy or numbness or tingling, particularly in sort of the hands or the feet um, that is, is noticeable independent of cold. Uh, and that's a side effect that sometimes can take a long time uh, to reverse and improve. So we we can only really manage that by proactively adjusting and modifying the dose. So uh, it's really important to be forthright with your oncology team if you start to experience numbness that lasts for a longer period of time. Next slide. And then in terms of the targeted therapies, I wanted to just spend briefly talking about the skin side effects with the EGFR inhibitors. Uh, the cetuximab or panitumumab, which are both given IV, usually on an every two-week schedule. Um, the skin rash is seen by probably more than two-thirds of patients. This is different from what I talked about with capecitabine. This is like, it's like a acne-like rash, and it's usually tends to be uh, dominant in the face, in the upper chest, in the upper back. Um, and uh, the good news is that if we use preventative treatments, we can reduce the risk of getting a severe rash. As you can see on these pictures, sometimes it can become quite dry and red and irritating. Um, but typically the use of antibiotics and a specialized creams uh, started at the same time that the treatment has started can reduce the risk of getting more severe rash. Um, and then similar to what we talked about before, minimizing dryness, so avoiding really hot water um, and, and, or hot baths is a good idea. 
using sunscreen to protect your skin from the sun uh, and typically using sort of liberal use of a moisturizer is really important. Um, despite these strategies, sometimes the rash can become quite bothersome and in that case it might require an interruption or a break from treatment to allow that to improve. Next slide. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's really important for us to, to really make ourselves aware of the information that is provided uh, to us when we are advised about the potential side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, in, I've given some pictures of these are the typical handouts that we give our patients at BC Cancer in Vancouver. Um, and they're, they're, they're like homework. These can be like 10, 12 pages long, but it is, it's a lot of useful information and important to be sure that we're familiar with that when we're starting on chemotherapy. And especially important to know whom to call if there was an issue and you needed some guidance. And so, um, again, knowing that up front is, is, is helpful in, in your treatment plan. Next slide. And so, uh, with that, I'm going to hand off to Dr. Lafren, who's going to talk about uh, radiotherapy and colorectal cancer. Thanks, Charlene. So I thought uh, I would give you a bit of primer about radiation and how it relates to colorectal cancer to kind of help understand um, why it causes side effects and what those side effects might be. Um, so radiation is essentially just powerful x-rays that are targeted to tumor cells with the intention of damaging the DNA. And those tumor cells don't have the ability to repair that DNA damage and the whole is, is that they go on to lose the ability to continue dividing. Um, normal tissue DNA does get impacted as well, and that's why you have side effects from radiation treatment, but there is actually the ability for that normal tissue to repair itself. Uh, next slide. So in colorectal cancer, the primary reason why we give radiation treatment is for rectal cancer, um, it's usually given before surgery with the intention of trying to shrink the tumor um, before surgery or to try to decrease the chance of it coming back in the pelvis in the future. Next slide. Other less common reasons would be in um, a case where a tumor is more advanced than what we were anticipating after a rectal cancer surgery. Next. Sometimes it's used for very large colon cancers if the surgeon is concerned that they're not going to be able to get all of the, the cancer out. Um, and occasionally we use it for the ablation of metastatic deposits, and that's what stereotactic body radiotherapy is. And in palliative settings where uh, we can't remove the tumor surgically, but it's causing pain or bleeding, we also consider radiotherapy. Next slide. So in order to start radiotherapy, you'd be assessed by a radiation oncologist and a treatment recommendation would be given based on the staging investigations that you've had done, which would be you know, determined on uh, discussion with your medical oncologist and your surgeon as well. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, so once the radiotherapy has been recommended, next slide, you would actually undergo another CT scan, which is called a CT simulator. Um, it's same as a, another CT scan that you would have had, um, with the exception that this one is used to specifically design radiotherapy for the tumor and for the patient. Um, so it's a custom, a, a way to custom design the radiotherapy plan. And you'll actually be lying in the position uh, that you will be receiving your radiotherapy treatment in, and you'll be given a tattoo which is depicted in this picture it's a tiny about the size of a freckle one goes on the belly and one on either hip next slide so the radiation oncologist uses that CT scan to actually draw out where uh, the tumor is located uh, and also where the normal structures are. And so the CT scan shows us where radiation treatment is gonna go. And so the rectum is gonna be touched by radiation, but so is the small bowel, the bladder, and in women, the vagina, and in men, um, the prostate. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So radiotherapy is delivered uh, daily, Monday through Friday, and depending on the intention of treatment, it could be given five days, um, Monday through Friday, we call that fractions, um, or it could be as long as 28 days every day, Monday through Friday. Next slide. Uh, radiation therapists are the ones that actually operate the machine. What they would do is they would line you up on a table according to the tattoos that you have placed and then take some x-rays to make sure that you're lined up in exactly the right position. Next slide. Um, it's similar to getting an x-ray. You don't actually feel the radiation delivery. Um, the side effects are cumulative. So the first week of treatment, you may not notice anything. So if you're only getting five days of radiotherapy, you might not actually notice any side effects until your treatment is done. Um, for people who are on longer courses, it might be the second week of treatment where you start to notice the side effects. You will not be radioactive. You will not lose the hair on your head. Um, and nausea and vomiting is fortunately not a common symptom associated with pelvic radiotherapy. Next slide. The most common symptom is fatigue. And this is something like a lethargy that just kind of gradually gets worse as you go. Um, the other side effect is irritation to the rectum and the bowel, where you might notice urgency to get to the bathroom, more frequent bowel movements, looser stool, or maybe even some passage of stool out of the rectum. If you have an ostomy, the output of the ostomy may be increased as well. For tumors that are low, um, kind of near the anus, the skin around the bottom end in the anus can get irritated, kind of like a sunburn, so it can get itchy, um, or passing a bowel movement could be a little bit uncomfortable. And less commonly, but we do see it, is the bladder can get irritated. So you might start to pee a little bit more frequently, have urgency to get to the bathroom, or, or maybe even a little bit of burning with pee. Next slide. So um, the best advice that I can give you in terms of management of your energy level is to just try to avoid being inactive all day. If you're coming into treatment already an active individual, I would say continue that activity as tolerated. If you're someone who's on the more sedentary side, I would say just try to get out for a short walk at least once a day if you can tolerate that. In terms of the alteration of bowel habit, we start with watching your dietary fiber intake and managing it that way. But if you're needing help with kind of anti-diarrheal medications, your care team will provide advice in that regard. For irritation to the bottom end, um, that utterly smooth cream that Charlene had talked about is actually really helpful and sits best, which is just lukewarm water um, that is, um, you can buy a sits bath tub that actually fits on your toilet bowl, or you could fill up your um, bathtub, put a little bit of table salt in it, and soaking in that after a bowel movement or before bedtime can be really helpful. Next slide. In terms of long-term implications, unfortunately, it is associated with infertility for both men and women. So if um, having children in the future is the goal, we recommend either sperm banking for men or egg harvesting for women um, before starting treatment. Women will also go through menopause, and if that is uh, for a patient that you know wouldn't normally be going through menopause at this point in time, hormonal therapy replacement is important to prevent the early kind of complications of early menopause. Uh, for women, the vagina can become a little bit more narrow or shortened or dry, and that can have an impact on sexual function. And for men, there is a risk of erectile dysfunction as well. And so that's an important thing in survivorship to make sure that you're connected with the appropriate sexual health specialist to um, help manage any things that you're, you're going through after treatment. In terms of the bowel function, what tends to happen is people tend to have a little bit more frequent bowel movements, looser stool than what their baseline bowel habit was. And that's often something that can be managed with dietary measures. Next slide. Um, so stereotactic radiotherapy and brachytherapy are not 
generally used in the management of rectal cancer, but can occasionally be considered in the setting of metastatic disease. For brachytherapy, not something that's commonly used across the country, uh, but occasionally we do see it in, in some cancer centers, but certainly wouldn't be a considered a, a standard in most cancer centers. Next slide. So just to summarize, radiation is just high-dose x-rays that are targeted to, to damage DNA in cancer cells, and we give little doses every day over several days. It's primarily used before surgery for rectal cancer surgery, and the recommendation as to whether or not you require radiation is usually based on a joint discussion between you, your medical oncologist, and your surgeon. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gill and Dr. Lafrain, for a very informative session. Uh, we're now being joined by Rebecca Latimer and Anita Fishman. And before we start with the panel discussion, uh, let us take the time for you both to introduce yourselves. Rebecca, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm a nurse practitioner at BC Cancer in Vancouver, and I work uh, predominantly with patients with uh, gastrointestinal cancers. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Annetta Fishman, and uh, I am 40. I was 45 years old when I was diagnosed uh, with colorectal cancer, stage 3, 3B. Uh, I am um, almost exactly two years later and excited and honored to be here to contribute and share. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rebecca and Annetta for joining us. And, um, you know, before we open up the session to questions and answers from the audience, uh, we thought we would use this opportunity a few minutes to kind of talk about the information that was shared. And um, I really wanted to start, Annetta, with your perspective uh, as a patient, because I think one of the the, the takeaways we're hoping uh, will come out of this is how can we how can we best prepare our patients and share uh, sort of information and strategies on on managing side effects. Uh, and I wonder if you would be um, able to share kind of what your experience was and how uh, if things were done differently, how would you recommend to your healthcare team that they counsel patients on side effects? So um, I had a great experience, um, <laughs> to say the least. I had a, um, a nurse navigator who really supported the process of um, collaborating with both the radiation um, oncologist and the chemo um, oncologist, and, and um, together with my surgical oncologist, uh, they all worked together to um, provide me with as much information as possible. I had um, a 28-day um, radiation together with oral um, chemo, and um, I, I, I think that in in sitting and listening to um, to to what they had to say when they introduced the treatment plan, um, there was um, I was trying to take in all of the physical. Um, information about the physical side effects, um, but I think that what was really important for me um, at the time was really to get to know um, the team as well and, and to establish some kind of relationship and rapport and trust because I felt um, that my mental state at the time, um, you know, I was, I was hijacked. <laughs> Uh, by a very unexpected and sudden diagnosis. I did not have any um, symptoms aside from fatigue and the whole screening process for me was really came out of the blue and, and um, I'm really I was really lucky. Um, I was lucky mm -hmm. to be able to um, uh, to be embraced <laughs> by a fantastic team who was really supportive. Um, so I think that um, more inform the, the more information um, that you listen to without doing the Google <laughs> searches, the better. I think that the Google searches are, are, are great, but I think that the information that comes directly from the uh, physicians and the team um, in collaboration with the nurse navigator is really um, important and worked for me. <laughs> 
Thanks, Anetta. So maybe, um, Rebecca, as a nurse practitioner, can you share with us when you counsel patients about treatment or managing side effects? Are there certain um, tips that work better or how do you, like, how do you find it, your experience in terms of how patients receive that information? Yeah, thanks, Charlene. Um, I think just as um, Anetta had alluded to, you know, just trying to really get familiar with your team and being as prepared as possible. So knowing who your supports are going to be, um, you know, with radiation and with, with medical oncology, and also just knowing who your supports are in the community and in your family as well, and who you can rely on if you need someone to drive you to an appointment or bring you a meal or something. Um, and then along with that, just being prepared um, with having, you know, some of the medications at home, like Imodium and having a thermometer and just some of those things that you can do beforehand um, to just have ready for um, when you embark on, on your treatment journey. Um, and, and not being hesitant to, to ask for help if things aren't going well with, you know, your first cycle and you're having a lot of symptoms and having difficulty with managing them with the medications you have been provided, you know, reach out, use those phone numbers you've been provided um, to call um, if you need more guidance or more support. Maybe I could, it, you know, it's, it's 2021, it's hard not to recognize we've been in the midst of a pandemic and that has uh, changed. We've tried to adapt how we are, you know, informing our patients. Maybe Shiloh, if I could ask you, when you're discussing radiation plans with patients, and it's a lot to, to unpack because it's about the why and the how and the what to experience. Um, how, how are you doing that experience through, let's say telehealth? How are you navigating? <laughs> that yeah that's a great question i guess um when we started with telehealth um we were doing all of our consults first by by telephone and explaining everything over the telephone and and i felt like i there was a lot that was lost just in terms of not because i was using telephone rather than actually video communication and so you're not actually seeing the body language and the reaffirmation that there's understanding or maybe they're confused um yeah. and then what we would do because everybody has to come in in person to actually do a ct sim right the planning scan you would meet with them and and they didn't understand half of what you said or they couldn't remember half of what you said and i'm not sure if that is hopefully that doesn't happen to all of our patients. I think probably, you know, they're, they're, it's volume overload. And, and so that probably is somewhat a normal reaction for some people. Um, but I, I think part of that was just lost in translation through the, the telehealth. And so what I, I tend to do is if, if I have to do a telehealth visit, um, I actually plan to talk about the toxicity of radiotherapy in person when they come for their CT sim um yeah. just because it's it's just too much information yeah i think you know my experience has been similar and i i agree with you that when we're speaking with a patient as an anetta talked about trying to build it to not do it in person is a challenge i think one of the silver lining opportunities um has been trying to build like online tools like you know have videos i like i you know saying well this is so that patients can sometimes hear that information again. Um, I think I think in 2021, we're still very reliant on handouts. And I don't know if uh, when Annetta was counseled, whether uh, there were um, tutorials, those like things about what to expect. Um, yeah. Or whether you were just given information by, by paper. So, yeah, so I, I, I had a bind, like I still have this binder, <laughs> right? Because the information was provided to me on paper and I had to organize and I found the, the, the paper and the information, the, the information helpful, but not at the moment. So at the moment in my, um, in my, during my appointments, I used the notes on my phone to, um, I, when I thought about questions, I would write them beforehand um, and then ask the questions 
um, or look at them to see if there's anything else and, and, and then process the information. And that, then I would connect with the nurse navigator if I had to ask questions later on after my appointments. Um, she was really instrumental in helping me process because I think that, you know, there are the, the side effects of the treatments themselves during, you know, chemotherapy and radiation. And there are the, also the, the, the other side effects as I um, shared before, you, you do get, you know, really um, nervous and excited and, and, and grateful and, and uh, scared and all, you know, all in one. And um, so to process all of that information at the moment is difficult. Um, and with all the appreciation that I have for the medical professionals, uh, sometimes the terminology um, is all new. So it's difficult to, to process the term terminology and the, the process um, of what is going to take place. Um, so yes, the binder is great. Um, was great to, to but I, I do think that today, especially the, like you, yeah. you mentioned, um, Dr. Gill, the silver lining of being able to access information online um, is helpful, could be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, this session will serve as a resource and we can maybe, you know, build on that to have sort of more um, 21st century tools for our patients and you know in counseling them and managing side effects it really is a a, a collaborative team effort in terms of uh, the healthcare team and, and the patient and their supports to get our patients through uh, their cancer treatment journey so thank you all for participating in the panel i'm looking forward to a lively uh, q a to follow um, and uh, thank you again to uh, the meeting organizers for the opportunity Thank you so much, all of you, for the great discussion and the pragmatic tips also on how you pivoted in, in, and to try to adapt in that time of pandemic for topics that are so important, um, uh, like that relationship with your patient. Thank you, Aneta, also for sharing so candidly your story. So you, we will now open the floor for questions from the audience. I do rem uh, remind everyone that if you want to ask a question, you can just use at the top right um, of your screen, you can just use the question button and capture your question, and uh, we're gonna um, we're gonna answer all of them. Hello, everyone. Um, maybe a first question, um, probably from you, Dr. Gill, but I'm interested on in having the perspective. Is there's a question from Andrew in? icing during uh, oxaliplatin. So is it also practiced in, in, in Canada on, on uh, oxaliplatin treatment, the icing? The I icing with oxaliplatin? Yeah. I, I'm, um, I have to confess, I'm not entirely sure what they're referring to. So generally, uh, you know, with oxaliplatin, we talked about sort of nerve toxicity and how initially yeah. it's often triggered by exposure to cold. And so for that very reason, we typically will avoid, um, you know, it, you know, cold. We to instruct patients on, yeah. on, on the importance of cold avoidance. There are There is some literature um, in terms of, I'm sorry, peripheral neuropathy with chemotherapy um, that has shown, but these are like platinum-based chemotherapies that has shown that uh, patients who um, ha wear cold gloves uh, can reduce yeah. their risk of peripheral neuropathy. So but that's like with taxanes, uh, but that's a huge no-no with oxaliplatin because of that interrelationship with cold. Okay, and and maybe on the same, like again, um, there's one uh, patient, Glenna, that was asking um, how long it takes usually to recover from um, the chemo and induced peripheral neuropathy. Yeah, this is a big question for many patients because um, one of the lingering effects of of a course of oxaliplatin treatment is is peripheral neuropathy. And it's highly variable. I wish I had a good answer for that question. It depends very much on what the cumulative or total dose number of cycles that the patient received and what the severity of that nerve injury or neuropathy was. Uh, but I often caution patients that it's a timeline that's not weeks, it's typically many months and sometimes years. <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a, there's an interesting question because you mentioned like how can you have the information like the binder and how can you capture information and have access to all of that. There's a question that is asking: Would you let patient record the conversation for personal review? Um, giving the information overload is that something that you would you would agree to do? Um, and any Dr. Lefren maybe. Um, I'm seeing you not. Is it something that you've been asked to do? Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, so so we certainly have been um, asked to do that. And I, I think different cancer centers probably have different policies on that. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly at our cancer center, uh, we do allow that and, and think it can be extremely helpful, particularly if there's certain family members that you want to have present um, that can't be or for you to review. Um, you know, the, the big thing is, is this information is your private information um, and what is being ad advised to you may not be relevant to another patient who's going through cancer therapy. And so we wouldn't want it to be, you know, posted online or shared on a forum, for example, because we wouldn't want people to think that that applies necessarily to their case. But I will just also add in the era of the pandemic, we had talked about that, you know, lots of cancer centers are asking for you know, not to bring your family members or spouses, for example, to an appointment because you're trying to limit contact points. And I found, you know, just either recording it or or having them on speakerphone so that extra set of hear ears is there can be can be very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Lefran. Anything to add to this in terms of uh, maybe uh, again in terms of as a patient, um, how do you? In terms of COVID, how do you get that information of not having someone with you? So any any tips on how you've managed that? So I think um, that I, I agree that um, if there is a possibility to um, to record, um, that would be really helpful and supportive. I think that it will also um, increase access to the um, information and maybe address some of the barriers that may be experienced, whether it's through language barriers or, um, or, or, or just understanding the state of mind that you're in, being able to go back and review the information um, and then record, um, you know, take notes or record it in different ways. So that would be really um, helpful. And again, it depends on, on uh, the policies um, in the various clinics. Um, but yes, uh, you know, I, I think that recording would be really um, helpful if possible. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question about the uh, radiation uh, cytosis. Um, any evidence, and, and I guess uh, maybe Dr. Lefren, that the um, oxygen chamber is useful for women. Um, the question is mentioning uh, evidence um, read for men, but anything in terms of for women. Any comments on this? So I guess I would have to ask, um, is that evidence in, in an effort to preserve fertility? If, if that's where that question is coming from, I'm certainly not aware of mm. evidence to support that. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something that is used after radiotherapy for people who have had um, significant complications from radiation treatment. Um, it's certainly not standardly used for kind of uh, not major toxicity, so say things that are, are dramatically impacting your quality of life or may require a surgery to repair, for example, um, because a hyperbaric oxygen therapy is an, a major investment in your time, actually, you need to, yeah. to go into a chamber um, multiple times for, you know, it could be a, every day for a course of six weeks, for example, um, but in extremely severe cases of toxicity of treatment, um, we sorry, treatment side effects, we have used it, but I am not aware of it being used as a preventative measure of, of, of preventing toxicity. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, the question wasn't uh, clear in terms of, of, of that. So thank you for answering that. There's a question about prevention of hair loss, like about cold caps, are they working or anything else that again, you suggest patient, maybe Dr. Um, Dr. Gill. I wish there was uh, something that would <laughs> had robust evidence to support prevention of hair loss. Unfortunately, again, 
um, similar to kind of what we talked about with neuropathy and hoping that you you vasoconstrict the vessels with cold and you reduce the sort of exposure of the drug and minimize toxicity. That same rationale has been applied to cold caps. Um, you know, I I think that it's uh, I have in in uh, I have seen patients explore that. It's something that patients at our center have also used, uh, but I'm not familiar with the evidence to suggest that that actually prevents hair loss. Um, uh, you know, it, it is obviously a, a very troubling side effect for patients. I don't know if yeah. Rebecca has had some experience with patients uh, requesting cold caps. Generally, in colorectal cancer, I found that because, you know, um, with oxaliplatin, hair loss risk is quite uncommon. It's really in those patients who receive uh, arenotecan where that question comes up. Okay. Yeah, I okay. think similar to Sharon, I, I haven't really had much experience um, with seeing the effects of it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, need to deal with. Um, so uh, unfortunately, like again, um, you, you had so much information, so such great presentation and information. Work. We don't have more time for question. I can see to the audience that the colorectal uh, cancer team is capturing the questions that are not being answered. So we'll find a way to put on the website for you to, to have the answer and to get the answer from the panelists. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, have a five minute break. That's a chance for all of you maybe to go to the photo booth um, or the exhibition hall if you have not done so. Remember that we have the objective of creating a mosaic of all the pictures. So. Um, please uh, go and take a few. So we'll see all of you after the break for the session on nutrition that will start at 2.35 sharp. Have a good break.